them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men and go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of a nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired that he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Then they stood on each side of Moses holding up his hands. So his hands held steady till sunset. As a result, Joshua, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. After the victory, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to, to who? Read it aloud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Read it aloud to Joshua because I'm going to erase the memory of the enemy. He didn't just say I was going to defeat an army that was coming. I said, I'm going to erase the memory of your enemy from under heaven. What a promise to us. Next one. Moses built an altar there and named it. Which means the Lord is my banner. Jehovah or Yahweh Nisi is where we're going today. The Lord is my banner. You pray for me, I'll pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray today that, that you who are already here, Father, your presence came with us. You are always in us. We are always in you. Father, as sons, we've come to the homestead. We've come in today to sit and to hear and to worship you the way that Adam worshiped you in fellowship and in communion, the way that our Lord Jesus made space for us to have a place in this kingdom. We've come in as sons and as daughters to hear what our Father has to say today. Father, I pray pray that you anoint my lips, that I don't stand in the way of what you're about to do in this place, oh God. Father, remove every motive, every method, everything in my spirit and my mind and my body that thinks about self-accomplishment or aggrandization. I pray, oh God, that even now that I decrease and you increase, oh God, in this house. I pray that the presence of God will be strong in this house. I pray that you are free to move in and among your people. I pray that their hearts are open. Will you just declare right where you are, even if you don't like this church, even if you're here for the first time, even if you're already in love, will you declare that your heart is open to the word of God? Will you say it again? My heart is open to the word of God. Father, we declare it with our lips. As you just deposit the seed of the word deep into hearts that are open, I pray, oh God, that plants spring up that become trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord in the name of Jesus. We give somebody a massive, humongous, squeeze the life out of them hug and then have your seed. <laughs> How many of you had the life squeezed out of you this morning? Good. Only one person. <laughs> Praise be to the name of God. So... I have a quiz. Let's start with a quiz. We like to, we like to communicate a little bit in this church while we do our, our while the, we listen to the what God is saying. Um, so you got to talk back to me. I mean, two weeks ago we actually had two armies in this place: the Philistines, you remember, and one was like, I won't. Anyway, you had to be there. 
Okay, so you guys ready? Let's do it. First one. If you know it, say it. How many of you didn't know that was a Trinidad and Tobago flag? Jody, I didn't tell you to marry into stupid, but if you weren't, <laughs> I'm sorry. Chris is the only one who didn't know that was a Trini flag. Oh, he was lying. Okay. <laughs> All right, next one. GT. <laughs> you hear how loud that was? Okay, calm down. I didn't say chair. I just say identify. All right, next one. All right, next one. <laughs> Apparently, this is the flag of, yay. <laughs> USA, USA. Okay, keep going. Okay, some people knew. Next one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's getting quieter. Less of you know, but some of you still know. Next one. Cuba. Who said that? Cuba. There you go. Cuba. Next. Yeah. We have a smart church here. Next. Yeah. Some of you are like, wait, wait. It have like three countries with a very similar flag. Next one. You guys don't know what the Union Jack looks like? This is Australia. This is not the UK. Ooh. It says the man who says we were British just two decades ago. In fact, I think he said that yesterday. <laughs> Next one. Barak Tor. <laughs> Zimbabwe. Yes. <laughs> it's Zimbabwe. Good job there, Andre. One person knew it. Is that it? Oh, we have one more. Let's see one more. Jehovah Nisi. <laughs> I can't see you guys back there. All right, um, all that to tell you that every single one of those represented a country. Every, every, every flag there represented a people, a nation, a, a, um, some of them democracies, some of them not. It didn't matter whether they're good countries, bad countries, you identified their flags. And when your flag came up, woo, you knew it, you knew it. Very, very few of you knew Zimbabwe, just maybe if you learned it in school. And that is the banner, that is the banner at which, under which, <laughs> oh, Satan. Do you know that was an Irish drinking song? I'm not even kidding. Go read the history of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, of the song, the tune. The tune was to an Irish drinking song, which became an American drinking song. And then when they got the poem, they had to get a tune, so they choose that one. You're welcome. Not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that people identify the country by the flag uh, that they stand under. And this, this, this word that identifies our God is Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my flag. Or the Lord is my banner. Or the Lord is my standard. All of those things mean the same thing. And, and I know that in this church, if I were to ask how many of you know Jehovah as God, you'd all say yes. If I said, how many of you know that there is one God, you would say yes. But as human beings, we just name drop, don't we? Name dropping, um, by the way, psychologists say is a very bad idea. You ever talk with somebody, say, yeah, me and Shaquille O'Neal when we were in school together? First of all, if you and Shaq were so close, you wouldn't have to bring him up. <laughs> Yeah, me and Nicki Minaj, like when she used to live down the road. She really did, I think. Yeah, people in here say they went to school with her like 10 decades apart, but just, 
Name dropping is a way, I, I, read, I read something, let me just read you what they told me. The practice of casually mentioning the names of famous people that you know or claim to know in order to impress somebody else. That's what name dropping is and it causes your credibility really to decrease the minute you use it. I've found myself doing that sometimes. I'm, I'm, I must admit, I said, my father is like, let's leave daddy out of this, but he's notorious for name dropping. He loves that. You know who else? Randy Caldwell. That's for Randy. That's like saying, yeah, Pastor Sharon and I go way back. There are some people in this city that do that and I've never met them. I don't know them, I've never seen them. And, th and then I go to a foreign country to preach and they say, yes, yeah, so-and-so said you and them are like this. And I was like, who? <laughs> then all of a sudden your credibility goes down. Well, that's the same way when you use the name of Jesus or when you use Jehovah's name without knowing who he is, you're dropping a name that you don't know about. Wow. You're identifying with someone who may not even call you friend. Saying that you know him doesn't any more make you a knower of him than it makes you a knower of me without knowing me. But when you know who Jehovah is, then every name that belongs to him belongs to you. You can say he is Jehovah Sabah because you know what that means. If you know what that means, say, I know. That means he is fighting my battles. He is God, my victor. You can say he is Jehovah Rapha because he has healed my disease. You can say he is Jehovah Jireh because I was in a position where I couldn't do what I needed to do. And here he came through and provided what I needed in the nick of time. You can say he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you can say he's the lamb that was slain but can you say that he identifies me a standard a standard or a flag if you ever how many of you like epic movies like like braveheart and lord of the rings and you like to see war movies where people just slay each other 300 is like you mm. well have you ever noticed that there's always a guy with the flag in the front. Do you know that in medieval times, the guy with the flag was unarmed? What? He was always going in the front without a weapon. All he had <laughs> was the flag. Sure, he's on a horse, but he has no space for that jousting stick or that javelin. All he has is the flag that says everyone that's where our rank is that's where our army is if you see your flag go so you go so too if your flag going this way you're going this way too in fact that's how you identified which army you belong to because you walked under the flag and do you know that if the flag bearer fell that means if he got killed in battle, the next soldier next to him had to drop his weapon and pick up and pick up the flag because somebody always had to keep the flag flying high. And as long as the flag is flying, we are not defeated. As long as the flag is flying, the army is still fighting. As long as it's blowing, we can see where we belong, where our tribe is, where our people, what? Don't let the flag stay on the ground. So, how many of you would have loved to be the dude with the flag? No? <laughs> in, in Trinidad, when we were growing up, in high school, everybody had to be in a march past. <laughs> am, am I the only one? They made me do this. And your arm had to be like straight out. And then when you reach the people, you like have to go like this and like this and like. I'm sorry. But the person in the front 
had to have that flag right here. You American kids are so deprived. I mean, kids passing out, dude. After two hours in the hot sun, you're going to pass out. <laughs> but you better not break form. <laughs> but how we knew when to stop, the dude with the flag would say, ah, he's right. And then everybody's like, oh. Or eyes from, because the flag bearer is the one giving the commands for the army. Well, in the, in the scripture we just read, the people of God were in a place called Rephidim. You two. No, just you three. I didn't ask for props. Who wants to be Moses? <laughs> See, guys, this is Hope NYC. <laughs> Who wants to? Because <laughs> apparently he knows what he wants more than he knows what he wants. You've been nominated to be Moses. <laughs> Don't act like you know this story. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'll be on that side. I'll give you some context. This is what's going on. Israel, which is this half of the church, has just been liberated. They got out of slavery. Say yes. yes. Unless you love slavery, then don't say nothing. Don't want to hear you complain about slavery again. You guys are the Amalekites. Say, Ur. don't let me come over there. <laughs> That's my trouble corner. They think if you sit there, you don't have to do nothing. So you guys are the Israelites just liberated from slavery. Trust me. Besides Joshua and a few of them, these hundreds of thousands of people have no real battle experience. All you can do is make bricks. These guys, on the other hand, are seasoned warriors, descendants of Esau. You are you're fighters by nature. You love to take advantage of weaker people. <laughs> this, is, this is my crew. So the Amalekites have no problem attacking you. You understand? I need to let you know that this wasn't a Philistine-Israelite battle. This wasn't an evenly matched battle. This was a big army coming against a bunch of people who had no business fighting. So you were destined to lose this battle. Moses tells Joshua, which is um, Jason. Moses tells Joshua, he said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Tell him. I am going to go up on the hill and I'm going to rest for the first day. <laughs> That's not quite what he said. <laughs> but essentially, it's kind of like what he said. What he did say was, you're going to fight. This is like the worst flag ever. No, it's not the worst flag ever. It's the worst flag for this purpose. Here we go. Moses tells Joshua, he says, this part's right, you fight. I'm going to go up on the hill, and I'm going to hold the staff of the Lord in my hand. I believe it was held like this. Because this would get really tiring really quick. <laughs> so I think, <clears throat> and when he started, I'm sure it was very powerful. But then after a while, it's not so powerful. Anyway, he said, you fight. And Joshua's like, yes, okay. But I wonder if in my, his mind is he thinking, I'm fighting and you going where? <laughs> You're going where? Up on the what? Doesn't seem fair, does it? Guys, do you know that's where you are right now? I want you to look at the person who invited you and forced you to come here this morning and say, thanks a lot. Not with that attitude, though. Let me tell you why. Because while you're in your battle, that person went up on the mountain for you. Hallelujah. I got to let you know that sometimes going up on the mountain seems like an unnecessary thing. And what you want is someone to get in the mud with you. You want somebody to fight with you. But sometimes instead of fighting with you, a friend will fight for you. 
Sometimes, instead of getting down and dirty in your mud, they will get up on the mountain and raise their hands to Jehovah God and ask him to do something great on your behalf. And I want to tell you something. I can speak for myself. I'll take the friend who will pray for me in my time of... Mm. I will take the friend who will lose two hours of sleep to get on their knees before their God and say, Father, deliver my girl. Take her out of what she's in. Make her way where there seems to be no way for her. I would take that. Let me tell you why. Because your $100 might get me out of a jam today. But that king has unlimited resources. He can do what nobody... Oh, my gosh. When I was small, I used to sing, somebody prayed for me. And Jude used to sing, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of, why, why, why? Because we knew that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. And we knew that a hello from you or a phone call on a Saturday would do my heart good. But a prayer to the Almighty on my behalf will ring in eternity. It will change my situation. It will change me. Thank God for a friend who will pray for me. Thank God for a friend who won't just say, I'm praying. No, let's sit and talk to hypocrites. If you came, if you, if you came to church to get away from hypocrites, you came to the wrong church, because it's all of us, to some extent, have been hypocritical. Can you pray for me? I'm going through this right now. Response: I'm praying. No, you're not. You're eating, <laughs> or you're on Instagram. I'm praying right now. Probably. I made a promise to myself, I'm never going to say that unless I will actually do that. If I say I'm praying right now and I can't actually text you the prayer, I'm going to stop and drop whatever I'm doing. If there is anybody with me, you can ask my office. We're going to stop, we're going to take hands, and we're going to call your name before the Lord in that very moment. If I'm alone, then I'm on my knees. If I'm in my car, then the music goes off and I start calling your name before the Lord. I made a promise that if I say I'm going to talk to God for you, I'm going to talk to God for you. I'm not going to think about you. I'm going to talk to the Father for you. I'm going to stand there with hands lifted with the rod of God in my hand and say, Lord, if you did it for me, you can do it for her. So Joshua said, all right, I'll go. And he goes to fight. It's, it's battle day. Jude, play some battle day music. You guys look like you're ready to kill something. Moses, you're going up the hill. These two characters here, Aaron and her. Not her as in H-E-R. Her as in like Ben-Hur. Decide to make the journey with Moses. Because Moses is a little old. Now we know why Godly picked you. <laughs> That's my husband. I can say that for those of you who don't know. <laughs> so the Amalekites come up against the Israelites. Everybody look that way. You guys, can you please look a little scared? Very good. Oh, look at Gita. Gita's got She's doing it right. Don't look at Sister Judy. She can't look anything but, but happy. <clears throat> they're going to they're gonna destroy you. And Joshua goes into the battle thinking, you know what? If we go down, it's not because I'm not fighting. If we die here today, I'm going to give it my best shot. He's rallying the troops. He's saying, come on, guys, we can do this. We can do this. But as yet, they don't have tribes, so they don't have flags. They don't have banners. All they have is a stick. All they have. 
have is the rod. And in Exodus chapter 4, the first time we see this rod, God says to Moses, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And Moses said, I have a staff. He says, throw it on the ground. The Bible says it turns into a serpent. He said, now pick it up by the tail. Do you know why God did that, by the way? You ever wondered? Why a snake? Because that's what the enemy used to first topple mankind. And God had to show Moses that what was used to defeat you is now under your authority. Don't you ever think that that which was used to bring you down once can ever bring you down once God has delivered you out of a thing that is done. That's done. I'll pick it up by the tail. And if you need more proof, when the children of Israel were in the desert just a little while before this, serpents came out and started biting them and killing them. And the Lord told Moses, he said, take a rod, put a brazen serpent on the top of it and lift it up. And he said, when they look on it, they'll live. That always confused me. I'm like, Lord, why a snake? Do you know that's where the... American Medical Association and all that, you know, that's what I... Why a snake? You could have put like a cross? Pomegranate? Anything but a serpent? He's like, because the thing that the enemy used to destroy you, I'm going to give you the authority and the power to turn its own power against it and what the devil had meant for harm is going to turn around and be used in your favor the same person that tried to bad talk you is going to be the one that comes to you and says can you pray for me can you help me the same one that tried to get you fired is going to have to come back to you to get a job the same one that tried to drag your name to the dirt is going to say, you are the only friend. He said, I saw that. I saw that more than once. People write me and say, you are the best friend I ever had. And I say, but wait, now you the same one that stabbed me in the back. I don't say that. I think that. You're the same one. But God. Mm, has given you the authority. Honey, when you are his son. When you are a daughter, then the authority that belongs to Jesus is yours. You are a joint heir of whatever the Father has given you. And he has given you his own robe of righteousness. He's given you his own ring of authority. You don't believe that, but that's your business. Serious, you let snake bite you. Okay, I'll say it better because we have guests. Sorry family you allow the serpents to bite you <laughs> Christians running from the devil scared that if we testify the enemy is gonna steal our blessing can we get real scared to say let me don't talk about it because I don't want my luck to change it's not about luck for the blessings of the Lord makes one rich and he has no sorrow with it. I am not ashamed to tell people that I know the source of my blessing. I know the source of my joy. I know the source of my peace of mind. And it's not in any human being. And it's not in any material thing. It is in the joy of the Holy. It is the kingdom. It's the kingdom. Wow. Wait a minute. Battle start. Moses can't hear what's going on. He hears a dull roar, but he sees. And he goes like this. Ugh. And as soon as he's going like this, now you fight. I just pretend now. <laughs> you want to fight? Come, David. Yeah. Come, Providence. Bring some young fellas to show you how to fight. Fight. 
is at war. Yes, come here, Anthony. The fist fighting. Oh, oh, it's a fencing war. <clears throat> okay, guys, there's a war. Go ahead. Let's let Joshua be the Israelite and these three be Amalekites. You alone, sorry. Beat him up. No, beat him up. Joshua is losing. Moses lifts up his hand and all of a sudden, all three go flying. Boom, boom, boom. What? Joshua is just beginning to think, wow, I'm pretty good at this fencing stuff. But then Moses like gets an itch in the back of his knee. And then they're beating up Joshua again. And the Israelites. And as soon as the itch is gone, Joshua, Moses lifts. Guys, you got to pay attention with you. Work with me here. Do you see what's happening? I know I'm making it funny and there was blood and gore, but guys, relax. I see, I'm trying to get the point across that every time Moses lifted up the rod, the Bible says that Joshua had victory and was taking advantage of people while he had the victory. <laughs> but, but every time the rod came down, Joshua is getting his butt kicked along with the army of Israel. Go ahead, Moses. <laughs> if I was Moses, I would have been like, uh. <laughs> no, 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 hold it like this, like this. That doesn't look victorious. This looks, yes. Right here, right at shoulder level, yes. Looks way more powerful than like this, right? He was never in a match pass. Friend, I'm in the middle of a crisis and you're telling me you'll hold up your hands for me? What good is that going to do me? If your friend has a tried and true staff, a staff that is a testament to the power of their God, a staff that says, I was in trouble and he delivered me. Remember David's staff? I slew a bear. I killed a lion. I slew a giant. His whole staff was a testament of the power. This was the same rod that brought 10 plagues into Egypt. This was the same rod that we touched the Red Sea with and it parted. This was the same rod that brought water out of a rock. You get it? This was no ordinary staff. So what was the banner? What was the weapon? Moses had a secret weapon. Was it the stick? Was it the man? Was it his two friends? Was it God? So he couldn't do it without the rod, the man, or the stick? The stick, the man, and the friends? Think now. The banner? Y'all get this. Okay. The Bible says that Moses' arm began to get very tired. And his hands got heavy. And he couldn't keep it up anymore. It's been hours. And his hands are just dying so the two men went and got a, a a rock they got a rock and they put it so Moses could sit on a rock in the New Testament it says that the rock at Mariba the rock that Moses struck do you know the Bible says that rock was Jesus it says that Jesus was the rock that Moses hit that water came out of you know what God was saying there? He was saying, one day they will strike the rock. And living water will come flowing from the rock. And from that rock, those that drink shall never ever thirst. Do you know that's what it was saying? He sits on a rock when he grows tired. God is saying to those of you who know who Jehovah Nisi is, in your weary day, in the day when you feel like you can't lift your hands up anymore, there is a... 
a foundation. There is a solid, solid rock. And I know that on Christ, the solid rock you stand. But some days you sit. Mm. Because to stand means you're ready to fight. But to sit means you're in authority. To sit, you know what he said? He said, for he is seated at the right hand of God. And he has seated you with him in heavenly places. To sit down means that your work has been completed. When Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father, it was because his job on earth was done. It is finished. Moses sat down on the rock, but his, his arms, man, one man can only do so much. I get it. As a pastor, I get it. I tried to tell somebody yesterday. They had a dream, and I had a dream. And I tried to tell them that the Lord was telling them that I needed them. They didn't get it. The Bible says Aaron and her held up the man's arms. And as long as they held up his arms, Joshua won the battle. And Joshua defeated the Amalekites. Why? Because Moses' arms held the rod and his arms were held up. Honey, the person that brought you here today, you might think they extended an invite to you. But what they did, what they did was get alongside you and say, I'm not trying to impose anything on you. I'm not trying to force you to see anything any different way than you already see it. I'm just trying to hold your arm up the best way I know how. When you're weak, I'm here for you. When you're not, you feel you can't go on, I'll help you fight. That's what friendship used to be like, right? You're like, <laughs> they only my friend when they need a hundred dollars borrow. You got the wrong friend, sister. I got a church full of friends that will lend you money, but you better not ask. I'll get you if you ask. I got friends that will say, when you need, I'm there. And then the, the Lord God gives us this amazing promise. He said that if two or three are gathered in my name, I promise you I'll be in the midst of you. He said, if two of you would come together and agree as touching anything on earth, then it will be done. So you know what he's saying? Don't try to do this alone. Get somebody to walk alongside you. Walk with somebody. Say, I've got you. Because some days I'm going to need you. And you're going to have to pull me up. And then other days you're going to need me. And I'm going to pull you up. That's what friends are really for. That's, what friend, that's in the scripture. I didn't just make up a cool analogy. I stole that. He says, sometimes you will be weak. And then I'll lift you up. Look at this dude. Stand up, Aya. Look how tall he is. But I've picked him up many times. I pick him up. And, and sometimes he picked me up. See that big one behind the piano? Stand up. I'm picking him up since he was born. 10 pounds, 4 ounces. <laughs> and carry him. But sometimes he carries me. Because we're not just church. And that's what we do. And we, we don't point, point out your faults and say, well, we know where you were and we know what you did and we know what you're about. And it's not even like that. It's not even like that. It's more like, which battle are you fighting and how can I lift your arms up today? 
which battle are you going through and what do you need to get those arms stayed, stayed and, and, and high and heavy the Bible says that these two men kept the rod of God high that the Israelites won the battle over the Amalekites and God told Moses he said write it down what God did today thank you sons you can stay there actually you look cool there come Joshua He said, write it down and read it to him. Everything Moses did, God made him tell Joshua. He said, make sure Joshua sees it. And do you know why? Because Joshua was the one who was chosen to lead the people of God into the promised land. And God knew that he would need to know that his God was able. He would need to remember when he stood outside of Jericho that if he says march around these walls without saying a word for six days and on the seventh day then shout, then if God said to do it, he knew exactly what he was saying. Because if one day he said hit a rock and water came out and the next day he said touch the sea and it opened and the next day he said hold up the stick and we won the battle, then if he says march around the city, then the walls will fall if I do what he says and I get it sometimes your Christian friends will do stupid things what in your mind looks like a stupid thing they'll do idiotic things like go to med school at 40 that's what they'll do they take up their family and go to South Africa to sing songs They'll do stupid things like look at somebody in a wheelchair and say, get up in Jesus' name. And you're like, oh God, what is she doing? But then you watch and that leg starts to move. And you watch and that little boy gets up out of his wheelchair and starts walking. And all of a sudden, when the walls come, when the wall comes falling down, it's not such a stupid thing anymore. Moses said, I'm going to build an altar and I'm going to put a name on it. And the name of this altar is going to be the Lord is my banner. So the, is the Amalekites will want to know which nation are they fighting under. What does the flag of this, of this people look like? I, the Lord said to me so clearly and I wrote it. Understand what you're standing under. That's good. Oh, that's good. That's good. Understand what you're standing under. Because some people standing under the Union Jack. And some people standing under the Star Spangled Banner. But you as a son and as a citizen of a better country, you need to understand what you're standing under. Because you may not be able to see the flag that is flying over you, but the enemy of your soul, every demon in the spirit can see the flag flying over your head. And they'll say, I know that if I come up against her, I come up against Jehovah Sabah. If I come up against him, I'm coming up against Jehovah Jireh. If I come up against them, it is the Elohim. It is El Shaddai. If I come up against them, it's the lion of the tribe. How does the devil know? Because what they see flying over the son and over the daughter of God, what they see over your head dipped in the blood of Jesus Christ, what they see blowing in the wind of the Holy Spirit is Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner. I finish with this. It's an Old Testament story. He was there for the Hebrews, but I'm not a Hebrew. Unless I'm mistaken, every single person in this room today would be a Gentile. You are a Gentile. You are not of pure Jewish blood. So how does this 
even apply to you? In the New Testament, a certain guy named Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And the Lord Jesus said to him, unless a man is born again, he can't enter the kingdom of God. He said, is a grown man supposed to re-enter my mother's womb and be born again? Is that possible? He said, I didn't tell you to go back into your mother's womb, but unless a man is born of the spirit, born again of the spirit, he can't see the kingdom of God. It's the next line that's very peculiar and important to what I'm saying today. For as Moses lifted up the serpent, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. <clears throat> he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know what he's saying? He's saying the same deliverance brought with the rod of God to the Hebrews has come to you. Because just as Moses, where is that rod? Where is it? Held it up over the armies. Just as every time his arms were outstretched, they won the battle. God was sending us a deliverer who would stretch out his arms on another piece of stick and hold them up high. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And right there on Calvary, the son of the living God stretched out his arms and said forever and ever and ever, the rod, the staff of God will be lifted up over you. And I, Jesus, becomes your banner. Because in Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, all the names of God exist. In that one powerful name, Yeshua, every name that God has ever been named, he is the express image of the eternal God. He is the ancient of days in the flesh. Psalm 60 and 4 said it this way. You have raised a banner for those who fear you. Jesus flies high over those that fear him. He flies so the devil sees, don't touch this one. There is a, a, a fountain filled with blood that flows from whose veins? Emmanuel's veins. And the devil is afraid of that blood of Jesus. Yes, this, this is the last one, okay? 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says, For he who knew no sin became sin. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know what that means? That's why, by the way, there was a serpent on a stick. Because he who knew no sin became sin. He was in, in, in effect the snake. Because God put him in the place of your sin and my sin. last one I promise the best one of all you ready for this say yes you want to write it down Isaiah 11 and 10 ran all over me and this is how he said to finish today and in the living translation it reads like this hear this it says in that day the heir to David's throne, say the heir, to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Do you know who the heir to David's throne is? 
when the angel appeared to Mary he said he will sit on the throne of his father David and of his kingdom there shall be you know what it's saying this is an Old Testament prophet saying that Jesus Christ will be a banner of salvation to all the world and the nations that's us will rally to him because we see him flying high hope NYC over your homestead there is a flag in your embassy there's a flag where you live as an ambassador of a better country not because we're looking all the way forward to going back home but because we are bringing our home right here on earth so that his kingdom will come and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven honey this you mark my word this city is not going to stay the same. Stop getting scared that gentrification is going to chase you and drugs are going to kill you and people are going to shoot you. New York and this area of Queens is going to start the revolution. We're going to start the change in this city so that the whole world, the nations, the nation, I speak it over this congregation in the name of Jesus, the nations shall see the flag of Jesus flying over this place and they will rally to him want to know why 28 nationalities come here because the nations see the banner that's what his word says the nations will see the banner and rally to him and it will be a glorious place because he is Jehovah Nisi father you are holy Father, we just wave the flag of your spirit. We wave the flag of your salvation. We wave the flag of your righteousness. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we thank you for sending our Savior to hoist himself, to raise himself high above the earth, to pay the price we could not pay, to bring your sons and daughters home. I thank you that you brought us home. With your eyes still closed and your heads bowed, I'm not going to call you up front.